Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. Let's get started. Oh. Not a good song, but not something we're looking to today. Okay. So, it's hard to believe it's the fourth week of class. Week three for us, of course, because we start counting to zero. But today is our, uh, the beginning of our last week of the first third of the class, or the first half of the class, I like to call it. So next week, believe it or not, you guys have uh, your first midterm exam in the CBTF. As a reminder, this is just like another quiz. It's more comprehensive, but the format is similar to what you guys have seen already. But anything we've covered up to that point is fair game. Next week, on Monday, I'm going to start talking about a new topic, which is object-oriented programming. But we have a little bit left to do this week. And actually, uh, Wednesday's lecture is a lot of fun. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how sort of Java works behind the scenes and clear up some things that may have been confusing you. But today, I want to introduce one more piece of uh, the puzzle when it comes to how to represent data in Java. So we've talked about working with single types, uh, single values. We've looked at being able to work with series of values. And now we're going to start expanding the dimensionality so that we can work with 2D, 3D, 4D, higher dimensional data in Java. We're going to look at how to work with multi-dimensional arrays. And that's really kind of the last topic in this part of the course. The rest of the week, homework, quiz, uh, you know, MP0, the first part of the MP that's due next week, it is really practice, right? More practice with imperative programming. Okay, so. Just as a reminder, um, the early deadline was your deadline day this uh, weekend, so that was either yesterday or today. Uh, good luck getting your 40 points. Um, MP0 is due this coming weekend on your deadline day. So uh, either Saturday, either Sunday or Monday. Um, does anyone have any questions about this policy? Um, you know, I, when, so let, let me just be honest with you. So when I talked about this last, Fall, last spring, we started talking about this amongst the course staff. Um, a lot of them were like, no, you know, you don't want to have two deadlines. Like, students aren't going to like that, you know, whatever. Uh, and so far, you guys, it's like I've stunned you into submission or something like that. I mean, who wants to complain about this? Somebody wants to. There we go. Yeah, so the question is, I missed the early deadline by five minutes because, and let me summarize what you just told me, respectfully, I didn't follow instructions, right? I did not follow instructions. We have, we have laid out, in fact, it says very clearly, do not download the zip file and use this as the starting point. So let this be a lesson. Those 10 points, if you've lost them for some dumb reason, make sure that that doesn't happen again. The nice thing is, this semester, so in the past, it's like every MP was different and people kind of make the same mistakes every time. This semester, once you've got everything set up and you can push properly and you can run the local auto grader and you're confident in that, um, that should just keep working, right? So you shouldn't run into the same problem again. Uh, but if you lost the 10 points this time, is it gonna make a difference in your grade? No. It's highly unlikely, but let it be a lesson in following instructions starting or they getting help when you need it. Other questions? Um, yeah. Yeah, read the form. What's that? I said read the form. This has been discussed on the form. Yeah. The auto grader's not working yet. We are still working on it. We'll get there. It'll be up soon. I want it to work properly before we actually, so we're testing it. We did a lot of work on that over the weekend, so that's coming along. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do, though, right? Because I, I think there's some legitimate concerns about this multiple deadline approach. So here's, here's what I promise to do. At the end of the semester, I will compare the performance of the orange team and the blue team on the MP. And if there's a significant difference, I will adjust for that when I do the final grades. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, by significant, I mean like more than a couple percentage points. Percentage point or two here, it's just within the noise floor. But if there's a big difference, I don't expect there to be a big difference, but if there is, um, I will adjust for that in either direction, 
you know, you might be surprised. Okay, great. So, next week's the midterm. This covers everything up to this point. We will review together on Friday. There may be a special guest here on Friday. Stay tuned um, to help us review. Um, if you are trying to figure out how to prepare for the midterm, MPs working on MP0 is a great way to do it. Doing the homework is a great way to do it. Doing the quiz is a great way to do it. Today, uh, after class, I will take all of the programming problems from the first, really from the first last two quizzes. The first quiz wasn't very interesting. Um, I will take all those programming problems and put them onto the homework 125 problem set so they're there for you to practice. We had a couple of people that were still making up some of the early quizzes, but that's over, so those will be up there. Okay, and then we're gonna, we will continue homework next week during the midterm. I just wanna point that out. This will be very easy getting started stuff with objects, but it's important for us not to lose that time. So just plan on that. These will not be hard homework problems. The homework problems this week, last few days, uh, a little tougher. But once we start talking about objects for the first week, these will be pretty basic. Yeah, question. No. It's all in the book. I mean, the questions from the book would have been easier than what's on there now, right? So, I don't know, pick your poison. Okay. Any other questions before we get started today? Yeah. Will there be questions on the, about the book on this week's kids? Yes, there will. Yeah, the chapter is signed. No, we'll get there. We'll get it graded. Once you've pushed, you're good. Now, run the auto grader on your own machine before you push. That's the only way to, n to make sure that you didn't do the math wrong, or you didn't miss something, or things aren't working quite as you expected, right? But unless you've done something, unless you've done something bad, you know, unless you, now, this happens. Sometimes, you know, people um, modify the test suites while they're working to try to help them, and then they forget. It's like, oh, I got all the points. No, when we test, we use our test suites, um, which are the same as the ones that we gave you, but if you made modifications to them, that can confuse them. That's something to check for. Yeah. No, not right now. Yeah. Yeah. How many MP checkpoints are there? I think five. I think five. Actually, sorry, I think six, because I think the five is the last one, and we're starting at zero. There are six MP checkpoints. They're obviously not all going to be two weeks long. We don't have time for that. Some of them will be shorter. Um, but yeah, six MP checkpoints. Okay. So let's expand the dimensionality of the data that we can work with. So we work with series of data. That was itself very useful, and there's a lot of information in the world, a lot of data in the world that we can represent as a series of values. But once we start adding dimensions, now we're in really good shape. Until we talk about objects, this is as good as we can do, okay? So in Java, I can declare and use arrays that have not just one, but multiple dimensions. So on line two, I'm declaring an array called samples with a single dimension. I have a single pair of uh, square brackets over here on the left. That's how I tell Java I want an array of ints with one dimension. And on the right, I'm initializing that to have size four, to store four elements. So I have valid indices zero through three. On line six, now I'm upping my game a bit. Now I have a two-dimensional array. So I see two pairs of square brackets over here on the left in the declaration. And on the right, I now have to tell Java when I create the array, when I initialize it, how large each dimension should be. So this says my first dimension is size four, my second dimension is size eight. So I have valid indices for the first dimension of the array, zero through three, valid indices of the second dimension of the array, zero through seven, and this array can store 28 values, right? Okay, down here at the bottom, let's just see how this, and, and you can continue this on ad infinitum. At some point, you're gonna get tired of typing square brackets, but on line 11, I'm declaring a three-dimensional array of doubles with dimension size six in the first dimension, eight in the second dimension, and 10 in the third dimension meaning I have valid indices zero through five in the first dimension, zero through seven in the second dimension, zero through nine in the third dimension, and can store two 480 values in this array. 
Now, when we talked about one-dimensional arrays, we talked about the fact that we're associating metadata with each item in the array. So in a, in a single-dimensional array, every item in the array has this new piece of associated metadata, which is, is a single index. In a two-dimensional array, I'm now associating a pair of indices with each piece of data. And in a three-dimensional array, I'm associating a triplet, three indices with each, each piece of data. So that's really the difference here. Internally, if you think about how your computer actually stores information, there is one long array. That is the best way to think about computer memory. It's one huge single-dimensional array. So all of this trickery, all of these things that look like three dimensions, at the end of the day, have to be stored in one single-dimensional array in your computer's memory. But for the purposes of our programming, it can be useful to associate two pieces of metadata, two integers with a piece of data, or three integers, depending on the data that we're working with. Oh, yeah, I don't, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna blow past this really quickly because this gets, uh, how Java does this gets confusing quickly. So on line two, I'm declaring a two-dimensional array. If I take, now normally when I, when I, um, access values inside a two-dimensional array, I use a pair of indices, one for the first dimension, one for the second dimension, but here I'm only using one indice. So it turns out, if I do that, what I get back is a single-dimension array. So what Java is really doing is it's storing arrays inside of arrays. So my multi-dimensional array is really a single-dimensional array, which every, where every value is another array. So you think, you can think of this as a single-dimensional array of ints of size four, where every value is itself an array of integers of size eight. Okay. So, let's, yeah, so we can, you know, we can convince ourselves of this. Let's play around with this a little bit. Doesn't print anything yet, but let's print the size of this. So, sample slice is an array, it has a length, the size is eight, right? So if I print the length of samples, and if I do this, if I print just the length of samples, you'll see that it has size four. Yeah. So I have a one-dimensional array of size four, where every value is a one-dimensional array of size eight. And if I had a third dimension, every value inside that second array would be another array. So it's arrays inside of arrays inside of arrays. I can also, okay, so this, um, happily, I don't think we're gonna torture you with anymore. We used to have an MP, um, on, that, that had you use multidimensional arrays heavily, and we did some static array initialization in this MP, and it's terrible. Because it really, because you start to make assumptions about where the data is on the screen, and those are wrong, uh, based on where it is in the array. So just like I initialize a single dimensional array, if I want to do static initialization, I can use brackets, I can use the same, I can do the same thing in a Java array. So here I'm initializing an array um, where the first dimension of the array has size two, and every array inside that first dimension has size two. So this is a two dimensional array where the first dimension has size two and the second dimension has size two. And I can also use, so, I should have had a slide on this, but this is uh, how I access values inside a two-dimensional array. So in a one-dimensional array, I use one indice inside the brackets. In a two-dimensional array, I can use two indices, each in their own pair of brackets. So this gets me the first value from the first array, and then the first value from the first subarray. Again, so if you think about it, I've associated, so let's look at this, and we can see now both the data and the metadata. So the data's over here. So the data inside my, I stored inside the array is the value one, but I have this metadata associated with it, which, which is the pair zero, zero. I stored the value two, and I associated the metadata zero, one with it. I stored the value three, and I associated the metadata one, zero, okay? How the, how this maps down to here, again, can be confusing. So I don't suggest you do this. Um, you won't see this very often. Okay. All right, so let's go by. Okay, so here's one thing I really want to encourage you. 
when we do problems, and, and when you guys use arrays. How many people were taught about rows and columns in high school, in, in your class? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I don't, you know, maybe when you go home for Thanksgiving, you can go find that person and have a conversation with them about the fact that we talked. Rows and columns are a spreadsheet concept that really have no relationship with how we use multidimensional arrays. And I would suggest that you try, I know it's hard, it's like that movie, um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, right? If you could somehow erase that part of your brain, it would actually be good. You know, when people teach physics, they have to deal with all these people's uh, misconceptions about the world. Part of teaching physics well is actually figuring out how to convince people that they're wrong about stuff. Um, and you can find these great videos online. You know, there's a, how many people have seen this? There's a famous video where they go around at Harvard and MIT commencement, and they ask people to explain why the seasons happen. Has anyone seen this before? If you haven't, I would suggest you find this on YouTube and watch it. It is really funny. Okay? If you thought those people were smarter than you, think again, all right? Watch the video. Maybe you don't know why the seasons happen. What, once you do, you watch this video, you'll be able to pretend that you did before. Um, anyway, we don't talk about rows and columns in this class. I will not let those words escape my lips because it's, it's, it's a confusing concept. What you, the meaning behind the first and second dimension of a multidimensional array is totally up to you. Those are just extra pieces of metadata that you are associating with each piece of data inside the array. And this is particularly important when we start working with certain types of multidimensional data because otherwise you're gonna, the rows and columns thing is gonna make you think that you've organized the data inside in a particular way that maps to a particular spatial orientation. And that's wrong. Or it can be wrong, depending on how the person set up the problem. So you're in charge here. The meaning that you give to each dimension inside a multidimensional array is totally up to you and should be appropriate to the problem that you're solving or the data that you're modeling using a multidimensional array. All right, so why are we doing this? And again, I apologize, I sort of started here and worked forward, but instead we've talked about this, but what type of information do you think would be a good fit to be stored inside a multidimensional array. What kind of data in the world does it make sense to represent and to store multiple pieces of metadata with? Yeah. Images, right? Okay, so let's think about this. In an image, what's the data? Yeah. Yeah, each pixel is, is a particular, it's like a little dot of color, right? So imagine I'm putting together a photo. I get these little dots of color, and every dot has a value, which determines what it looks like. And then what's the metadata? So that's my data. But remember, the metadata is as important as the data. In a picture, what's the metadata? So if I'm putting, let's say I'm putting together a photo. I've got all these pixels, different colors, and I'm using them to, to try to assemble a photo. I pick one up, the metadata is where it goes, it's position. So I say, you know, imagine I start with a square canvas and I'm sticking things on there. The value is the color. The metadata is the position. So yes, a picture consists of a series of pixels. So here's a random photo, right? Every, so the way that a computer represents this is it breaks it into tiny, tiny, tiny pieces on a grid. It says, I'm gonna break this and, you know, depending on how large the pixels are, the picture looks fuzzy or it might look sharper, right? So here, there's a certain number of uh, pixels that we go across, certain number of pixels that we go down. Every one of those, if you zoomed in, and zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in, you'd see that every one of them, eventually you get to squares, and every one has a single color. So there are the data is the actual color at each pixel, the metadata is its position. Again, just like with music, I think it's more apparent with, sound, with a, a photo, but the position is as important. If I took all the pixels here and just scrambled them up together, you wouldn't have this nice photo, black and white photo of a waterfall, you'd just have, like, static. It would just look like blah, whatever, you know? It loses its meaning, so the metadata matters. A lot of scientific data 
is uh, multidimensional. So here, I don't remember what this is, um, but you know, you could imagine maybe this is like the temperature on the surface of a volcano or something like that. So here's my volcano, uh, and, and this representation is, is um, four dimensional, actually, right? I've got one dimension here, one dimension here, a third dimension of height, and I'm using color to represent the fourth dimension. So this is four dimensional data, right? So for every, you know, in, in order to figure out, you know, at, at every given point here, I need to know where I am in space, three dimensions, and then I have to have the color dimension as well, right? So four dimensional, all right? Um, music, okay, so this may confuse some of you. Uh, we talked before about music as single dimensional, but music is actually typically, unless you're still listening to the record player with old Joe Biden, um, music is typically multi-dimensional. Actually, even record players were stereo, sorry. I shouldn't have made that joke. Um, does, does this make sense to everyone? Music. What are the two dimensions in music? Yeah. What's that? Uh, I can I can represent every, I can represent music in in general as a series of measurements of pressure. That's a single dimensional um, data set. But where does the second dimension coming from? I'm giving you a big hint on this picture. Yeah. Oh, I, I just have one series, right? So time. Uh, the values are the measurements of pressure, and the one dimension is time. Yeah. What's that? No. What's that? I think I'm hearing the right answer, yeah. You've got two ears, most of you, I suspect. When you listen to music, do you, did you guys know this? When you listen to music, there's actually separate signals being sent to the right ear and the left ear. There are two separate tracks. And that's on the simplest possible music. How many people, you guys still go to movies anymore? I don't think you do, because when I go, there's no one there, right? But does any, has anyone been to a movie like in the past 10 years? In a theater. Okay, good. At a theater, there might be eight different tracks for a movie. You've got speakers behind you, to your left and right, up in front of the stage, one below the stage that's for voice, and then maybe a track for the subway. So typically when you listen to music, it's multidimensional. So there's lots of data out there in the world that we can store once we start to be able to work with multiple dimensions. And again, this is all data where for each piece of data, I have multiple pieces of metadata that I want to associate with it. With a picture, the data are actual little color swatches. The metadata is the position. With sound, the data is the series of pressure measurements. The metadata is both. There's two pieces of metadata. One is time. The second is which ear or which channel it's part of. If you're wearing headphones, which ear is it going into? Okay. So one frequent use, so you know, when we talked about arrays, we said, okay, we've got this data in an array. A lot of times what we want to do, a lot of algorithms that work on data consist of going through a data structure like an array or a multidimensional array and then doing something to it. Here's an example. So this is now going through a two-dimensional array. When we went through one-dimensional arrays, we used a single for loop. Now, every array is itself an array, and so here's the pattern that we use to go through a multi-dimensional array. So my outer for loop, and this is again one of the places where you're allowed to use single variable letter variable names. My outer for loop is using i, and it's going through the first dimension of the array. And my inner for loop is using j, and it's going through the second dimension of the array. And then inside that inner for loop, I'm using the double bracket syntax to print off the values inside the array. And if I wanted to see both the values and the metadata, I could print i, j, and the values. Okay. So, oh, okay. So let's, let's do our, um, so one of the, so an, another um, piece of data that we could store inside an array is data about a game. How many people here have heard of tic-tac-toe? Okay, so for those of you that haven't, I know this is a, something that might be cu a culturally specific reference. So tic-tac-toe is a game 
uh, played by two players, where you start with a board that has two dimensions, and you have one player uses X's, the other uses O's. In each turn, you're allowed to place, um, you know, an X or an O on the board in any one of the open spots, and the goal is to get three in a row, either three um, up or down, or diagonal, right? So those, that's the rules of the game of tic-tac-toe. So we can write, we could write a computer program to play tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe is one of the games that's um, in the world that's known as a solved game. Does anyone know what that means? Any game players out there? Anyone play chess or go or, yeah? Yeah, so essentially in a solved game, there's a known strategy for proceeding from any state in the game. So there's no, um, you know, s high strategy involved. There's always a right move, let's put it that way. And that's why um, in tic-tac-toe, unless you're playing against like a three-year-old, um, you can always, well, unless the three-year-old's playing against you, unless you are a three-year-old, um, you can always either win or force a draw, right? There's no reason to ever lose a tic-tac-toe. That means that you did something dumb, um, or you're a small child. Um, all right, so let's, so we're not gonna write the entire program to manage the game, but let's, uh, let's think about how we might check to see if there's a winner. So we're gonna write a little function here together. So the first thing we need to think about is how are we representing the state of the game? So I told you that there's a two-dimensional board and at each position in the board, each position in the board can be in one of three states. So either it contains an X, meaning that the player who is playing X put an X there. It contains an O, meaning that the player who's playing O put an O there in a previous turn. Or it's empty. And what I've chosen to do here, and you could do this another way if you were writing this game, but I've chosen to represent an empty spot using a period. So period isn't a valid tile, it's not a valid character in the game, and so I'm using a period to represent a spot on the board that no one has played in yet. So you can imagine how this, would, how this game would work inside your computer. Essentially, you'd have to uh, make sure that X's and O's play uh, one after another, and then every time somebody puts a new piece on the board, we need to check to see if there's a winner. So we need to look for three in a row. And we need to look for three in a row, either um, three in a row either across or down, right? So we need to find three in a row in the first dimension or three in a row in the second dimension. See how I'm not saying row, rows and columns? Um, okay, so let's, let's do this. So the first thing I think we should do, we're gonna write a little function here. Let's, let's just get some practice writing a loop to go through the board. So why don't we do that? Let's try to write a loop. Um, let's try to write a little function just before we check the board. Let's try to fi figure out how to, how to print the board out, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write my little um, board.length i++ plus plus. and then, okay? And so now let's just make sure that I'm getting the right values of i to start with. Oh yeah, it's mad at me because I didn't return anything. That's okay. Let's just return nothing for now. Okay? So this looks correct. The board that's being passed in has size three in the first dimension, and I'm seeing indices zero, one, and two. Okay. So my outer for loop is working. Let's write the inner for loop now, and we'll check this and make sure that works. So my inner for loop is very similar, except the condition is a little bit different. So rather than going through, so in my inner for loop, my outer for loop, I'm using the length of the first dimension of the board. But remember how arrays work in Java, when I have a multi-dimensional array, that means that every element of the first dimension of the array is itself an array. And so that's what I'm using here inside my second, to, to write my second loop. So I start j at zero, I continue j until it reaches the length of this particular subarray, and we'll see why that's important in a minute. And then I do j++. So now let's uh, print off i, and also we'll append on j here to see what's happening. And I need to stick all of these in. All right, let me drag this up a little bit so we can see everything. Okay, so this looks right, okay? 
So the first time through, I've got 0, 0, 0 for i, 0, 1, 2 for j. The second time, I've got 1, 1, 1 for i, 0, 1, 2 for j, and, and it's up. So it looks like I'm, my indices are correct. Now, let's do this. Let's try to get the value at that position in the board. So we'll do board i, j. Put another space here. OK. And you'll see here that I've got, so the, at 0, 0, so the first subarray, um, the first position in that subarray is x. That's right here. The first subarray, the second position is o. That's right here. The first subarray, the third position, indice 2 is period, et cetera. So I'm, this, this looks good. Now, if I wanted, what, what would I do here if I wanted to print this out a little, in a little bit prettier way? Here's one suggestion. So I'll show you how this looks in a sec, but here's my code. Okay. So what did I change? So I'm not printing the indices anymore because I'm pretty confident that I'm going through the board properly. Instead, I'm just printing the values inside the board, and I replaced my print line with a print statement. So that's not going to add that new line. So that means that the board is going to go left to right until I reach the end of each time through the inner loop, and then I'm going to start a new line. So I print x, o, and period on the single line, I jump to the next line, and I keep going. So now I've got a nice way of visualizing the board. Now, is there a winner on this board? There is, but it's a diagonal winner which we're not going to check for. So I'm going to get rid of that winner. Make, let me just change this. OK. So now there's no winner on the board, all right? But I want there to be a winner because I actually want to, to run this, and I want to see that there is a winner. So now there's a winner. Now, now I, I know, I don't know why O got to play so many times, right? You know, again, when you're, when you're playing with your, you know, child, when you're playing with your friends who are small, sometimes you'll let them cheat, right? So O win a bunch of times, right? Um, but we won't worry about that right now. And we're just going to try to figure out, given this board, we'll have some other piece of code that will make sure that people are playing fairly, or maybe not, depending on who you're playing with. But all this is supposed to do is identify that there's a winner on the board. OK, in, in either the, you know, either across or down. So how are we going to do that? Who has a suggestion for how to accomplish this? So I've, I've been able to display the board. It's a good start. But I actually want to detect when there are three um, in, a, in a row. So let me, let me change this a little bit to give us a little bit of an easier starting point. And when you guys are developing, this is a totally valid thing to do, right? I'll put another X in here. OK. So now I've got a winner going across. So how do I, how do I do this? What's my algorithm for checking? Now you can see the board. So someone describe how your code would work. Or just think about what you're doing when you look at this board to try to find well, out whether or so, not there's a winner. We're going to try to replicate that in our code. Who can describe an algorithm to me that's going to solve this problem? Yeah. Okay, so I, I definitely, I couldn't hear very well, but I got pieces of that. I like uh, what we started with, which is I definitely need to, clearly I need to loop through the array. Let's, let's just do this together. So let's say I was scanning through this. How do I do that? So I look at the first character. Let's say I'm looking for winners. Let's just do part of the problem. Again, whenever you're struggling with something, make the problem a little smaller. See if you can figure out how to solve that one part. Not only will you have solved part of the problem, but that might suggest a way to do the rest of it. OK. So let's look for winners horizontally. So the horizontal winners are going to be detected in my second loop. 
And here's, if I was looking at this, here's what, I, here's what I'm doing. I look at the first character, and then I say, is the first character the same as both the second and the third character in that, you know, the, that are going across? If it is, then I found a winner, right? Almost. We'll get to that in a sec. So let's try to write a piece of code that's gonna, that's gonna allow us to do this, okay? So I'm going through, now here I actually don't need the, um, this inner loop anymore. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna print the first um, element of whatever first dimension I'm in. Okay, so that's now just printing the leftmost element of every uh, subarray that goes across. O, O, and dot, right? So O, O, and dot. And what I want to do is let's say, let's do part of it. Let's say if board is I is equal to board I one. Print lin I, okay. All right, so what am I doing now? What does this piece of code accomplish? So this piece of code is looking in the second, it's looking in the second dimension of the array, and it's looking for places where the first value is the same as the second value. So the value with indice zero is the same as the value with indice one inside this second array inside the loop. So my loop is going through every, you know, uh, second dimension array, and it's looking for cases where the first two values are the same. So here, it's printing where I am in the first, uh, going through the, uh, the first loop. So basically it says, here's one place where that's true, and here's another place where that's true. So I'm close. How do I extend this to do more of what I want? So here I'm saying the first character is the same as the second character, but to win in tic-tac-toe, what has to be true? They all three have to be the same, right? So how can I do that? Let's add another if statement. And I could do this multiple ways. I could check whether the second was equal to the third, but in this case, I'm just gonna check um, whether or not the first is equal to the third. Okay, so this is close, except there's one problem. So this is now identifying two winners. It says there's a winner in the first um, second dimension of the array, and there's a winner in the third second dimension of the array. That's wrong, right? There's only one winner on this board right now. What do I need to fix about this? This code has a bug. Yeah. Yeah, I should ignore periods. Periods indicate an empty space. So here's a question. If there's an empty space, can there be a winner in that part of the array? No, because it has to be filled with pieces from either the first player or the second player. So here's what I'm gonna do. And again, there are multiple ways to do this. I'm gonna say if the first, the first value is equal to this, then I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stop because I know that, that it's impossible for there to be a winner at that part of the event. Okay. So this looks good. Let me clean it up just a little bit. Let's print, um, we'll print, just print a nice message here. Okay. What else can I do? Let's, let's say that this works eventually and I'm running it every time and the game's gonna stop as soon as there's a winner. So what can I do as soon as I find a winner? So a little bit of a optimization. What's that? Yeah, I can stop looking. Remember, this piece of code was actually supposed to return who won the game. So let's go down here and print the result. Currently it's returning dot because I have this down here. Um, so instead of that, I'm gonna say return. Huh. 
as soon as I get here, as soon as I find a winner, I don't have to do anything else. I'm done. This is a good, this is a good strategy for when to use return statements. This is something you can apply as you finish up the first checkpoint of the machine project. In certain cases, when you're writing a function or algorithm, as soon as you know the answer, you can stop. You don't have to keep looking. Now, I still have a return statement down there at the bottom, okay? And what is that for? So that's for cases where there are no winners. So let's break the winner here. So I took that place in the game where I was finding a winner, and I changed one of the tiles to X, so there's no winner at that spot anymore. And now it correctly says that there's no winner. All right, so I have correctly, I think this works. Let's test it. Okay, so let's add a winner in the second uh, array that I would need to check, and it still finds that one, so that's great. Let's add, like, a tile here. Okay, so that, that works, right? Um, Let's see here. Let me, let's put a winner down here all the way at the bottom. Okay. So this looks like it's working. However, it's not finished. And I'm gonna leave this as an exercise for the reader because this is a homework problem for later in the week. Here's a board on which there is a winner. If I printed this off, you'd see that there are X's going down. Three of them. My code does not identify this, so I'm not quite done. I need another, so you can think about it, is this part of my code is looking for horizontal winners. It's looking for winners horizontally the way that we printed the board before. Now what I need is I probably need another loop to look for vertical winners. So I need to look for winners going down. And if I really wanted to make this totally complete, I would need a third place to check for diagonals. We're actually not gonna make you do that. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to use this example to, to help point it out is this idea of testing, right? When you're, when you're writing code. Uh, we give you guys test cases, um, but I wanna give you some sense, and this is useful when you guys are working on the homework uh, problems, when you guys are working on your own code sometimes, to think about how to test your code. And typically what we do is just what we were doing together. I write some code, I pick the inputs for it where I know the answer. So I chose inputs where I knew what the winner should be. And then I can check to make sure that my program is producing the right output, okay? I didn't check every possible board, okay? I only checked a couple. And so part of doing a good job of choosing test cases is trying to pick ones that you think are gonna cause a problem. And this is something that you will get better and better at as you continue your career in computer science. Um, you will, so this is kind of uh, an, an interesting adversarial relationship that you have with yourself when you're working on a software project. And I, I do this all the time, right? It's this sort of Jekyll and Hyde thing. It's like you write some code and then you write tests that try to break the stuff that you just wrote. So, you know, you turn around and now you're in an adversarial role where you say, I don't think you did that correctly, and so I'm gonna see if I can find a way to crash it. And then you go back to the first role and you say, oh, I found some problems, things that didn't work right, I'm gonna fix those, and then you swap back and forth, right? And this is how people write good test suites. You essentially have to, you know, again, this, hopefully this chapter on debugging that you're reading has convinced you and helped remind you that this is, a, this is something that never stops. So again, if there's anything, I wrote this on the forum, but if there's anything you take away from this chapter in the book, it is that the fact that you write code that has problems does not mean that you are bad at this. You will never stop writing code that has problems, okay? The people that are interviewed in this part of the book are experienced software developers, and they're still making mistakes all the time. Think about it, I mean, you've lived through cases where there have been big outages of you know, big services like Amazon Web Services or Twitter or whatever, right? Those companies have thousands of really smart engineers working for them, and they still make mistakes all the time. Now, actually, they make a lot more mistakes than you notice because they catch a lot of them through testing and stuff like that, but they still mistake, make mistakes that you do notice, mistakes that take down their entire site, okay? 
So again, this, the fact that you are making mistakes is a sign that you are doing the work. It is not a sign that you are bad at this, okay? Trust me. Uh, ask any of the course staff, and that was, I'm sure they will be happy to regale you with stories of problems that they've, uh, mistakes that they've made. All right, let's not do this. Okay, I do want to talk about this, because this is important. This is on this week's, uh, quiz. All right. So then this is one place where you can get easily tripped up in Java. All right? So here's an example. I've got two strings up top, and I initialize them both to be new. And remember, I had this nice equality operator that we were using when we worked with primitives. The double equal sign is supposed to check for equal. And here's the problem with strings. Here's why this is confusing with strings. This is why I'm talking about it as a special comment right now. Is that it's with strings, this equality operator can be confusing. So this is weird, right? This returns true. It's not the right way to compare two strings. Here I've created two strings using the new keyword, and then I compare them using the double equals, and it returns false. So this operator is not doing what you think it is. Here's a simple rule of thumb. Whenever you compare two objects, there's a function typically provided called dot equals, and that's what you want to use. You should never test two objects for equality using the double equal symbol. Okay, with that, I think you are prepared for your quiz this week. Good luck with that. Um, I will be back on Wednesday. Oh, one other comment on this week's quiz. So check style is now fully operational, okay? It's not that you're gonna lose points. It's that you're not gonna get any credit, all right? Good luck with this week's quiz. I will see you guys on Wednesday.